All right, thank you for coming. Anybody who hears this message, it's super important, so I'm very happy to have everybody in the room. Jared in the back is Tribe Green Rising's video producer. He's been doing an amazing job. Super stoked to have him on board. And then someone who couldn't be here tonight is Caroline. She's our social media manager, and she is doing a fantastic job as well. Don't know what I would do without these two, so I'm super excited. Um, so I wanted to go over a little bit about why I started Tribe Green Rising. I've always been very interested in the connection between society and environment and our health and how those interconnect. Also, I've always had a fascination my whole life with connecting um, kind of like the pathway of something. So um, causes and effects like the root solution, the root cause, um, the beginning, middle and end of something. <clears throat> so for example, a conversation, I love to trace where that started and why are we talking about whales when we start talking about toast, that kind of a thing. So. Um, <laughs> I, I saw a few food documentaries about four years ago, and that's when I really started to realize some big issues in our food system. I had always kind of known, kind of like everybody knows in the back of your mind that there's something not right, but you don't really want to know. And then I did some research after the documentaries and realized everything on there was true. I even looked at some of the websites that would have proven, you know, things that weren't true in the videos and they were um, consistent. So. I'm not a nutritionist. I consider myself a sourcetarian, especially where meat products are concerned. I look at where things are sourced from, so how they're grown, how they're raised. <clears throat> so it, to me, it matters more where our food comes from than what you're actually eating. Um, so the importance of what I have to tell you today is, um, <laughs> well, here, let me show you this, this slide. So my mom drew this yesterday because she thought this was hilarious. I told her about <laughs> I told her about uh, where my outline was at. I had a 14 page outline and I realized, oh, I've written like a six week workshop. <laughs> I need to, I need to cut it down. So I actually had to restart my whole talk yesterday. And she said, if you do all of that, everybody's going to leave looking like that. <laughs> now I can't, um, I can't confirm that you won't look like this afterwards because this is a big message. Um, but I'll do, I'll do my best here. So raise your hand if you know one person with one chronic disease. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Two, two people with chronic diseases, five. Yeah, so this, this is a concerning thing, right? Even 70 years ago, like our grandparents' generation, this was not a thing. We weren't seeing this so much. Like they existed here and there, especially things like cancer, but not at the rate that we're seeing today. So um, has everybody heard of the frog in hot water fable? So if, if a frog's in hot water and you start raising the temperature, does the frog notice it? So to me, this is kind of where we're at. We're looking at our chronic health disease in our country and globally, we're looking at our environmental destruction, our climate change issues. So which frog are you? Are you the one that's chilling here with a glass of wine, you're enjoying the hot tub? Or are you the one in the middle kind of going, hmm, there's something going on here. Or are you this one in the front who's like, I'm getting out of here. I need to do something. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so I, I do want to ask, um, Raise your hand if you are concerned with our current state of the environment and our climate issues. Yeah. Now keep your hand up if you think chronic disease are connected with our current environmental and, and uh, climate issues. Okay. Uh, that's what I figured. That's how I feel too. Okay. So going into um, basically explaining the connection between the, a healthy gut microbiome and a person and um, healthy soil. So raise your hand if you've heard of a microbiome. That's good. Have you guys heard of microbiomes? Yeah. Uh-oh. <laughs> we need to do some teaching here. Okay. So a healthy gut microbiome is basically trillions of bacteria that we, that we have in our gut that when they're healthy and they're the right um, balance of bacteria, you have a healthy person. And when they're out of balance, you've got all these kinds of chronic issues that can show up on the left side there. Then we're looking at um, the soil health ecosystem. So the, basically the connection between a healthy microbiome and what it does to the body, um, and then healthy soil and what that does for the planet. So soil, healthy soil, is to the planet what a healthy gut microbiome is to the body. So um, basically a good way to think about it is, well, let me show you this. So a teaspoon of soil, just one teaspoon of healthy soil has more organisms in it than the number of people on earth. That's, we're over 7 billion now. In this, we've got all those organisms. And, um, and same thing with our gut microbiome. So our cells, our human cells in our bodies are outnumbered by the amount of bacteria. So we are more bacteria than we are human cells. That's something to think about. Um, so when you have healthy soil, you have a healthy planet. When you have a healthy microbiome, you have a healthy person. 
So what is happening? Let's look at our current dominant uh, food system. Um, and I, I do want to say first, this is not about blaming. There's a lot of factors that went into why we are where we are, but this has all happened in a very short amount of time, like 50 to 70 years. So we're looking at a concentrated animal farming operation, CAFO. Has anybody heard of a CAFO before? Yeah. So I have two pictures up here because I have a couple of different things I want to point out on those. So first of all, 80% um, of the antibiotics in the United States go into our farm animals as opposed to people. Now look at the condition that they're living in. They're standing their own feces. This is really unfortunate because, I mean, obviously it's a disease rampant area. They're miserable and they're being fed a diet that is not their normal diet. They are meant to eat grass. That's how their whole system is set up. They're eating corn, they're eating grain, they're eating soybeans. These are all pesticides sprayed as well because they're being grown on conventional croplands. Um, even things like bakery byproducts and candy with the wrappers still on it, all of that makes it into the feed that is put right in those troughs right at the end there. These, this is a top-down view, you've got manure lagoons here. Now the unfortunate thing about that is manure is supposed to be a healthy, good thing. It's supposed to actually help our soil be healthy, it's supposed to help plants grow, it's this whole ecosystem. Well instead it's this toxic thing that's going into these manure lagoons which is seeping into our aquifers, our, it's polluting our waterways, and it's not even good manure because the animals are so full of medications that um, this wouldn't be something you would actually want to put on our crops and what we eat. So um, it's under, the other thing too is it's understandable why at this point in our current food system a lot of people are starting to go vegan because they're scared of getting cancer from eating meat. Totally understandable because those animals are sick. A lot of them do have cancer. A lot of them are on their way to that if they live long enough. So that's kind of the current situation with our animal products. Um, now, when we look at our croplands, this is our dominant way of producing food. So we've got soybeans, uh, wheat, and corn are the main ones. They're genetically modified. We've got, um, uh, this is a vineyard here that's being sprayed with pesticide. Pesticides going on the fields here. And we've got an army of whatever coming across this at us, right? So <clears throat> lots of different things going on there. Basically nature doesn't operate this way. Nature wants biodiversity. It wants a lot of different things happening. And with a monocrop, you've got not only the same crop being planted over and over, so there's nothing different going into that soil, but we're also, it's also on thousands of acres, which is not how nature operates, right? So we're going against nature in that way. We have chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Now this is needed in an industrial system because the whole ecosystem has been broken down into parts and everything has um, kind of been torn apart from each other from this ecosystem. Nothing is healthy, like naturally, from a healthy soil base. So the plants don't even have a natural immune system. So when you're looking at that, yeah, we, there has to be pesticides because otherwise it would be completely overtaken by pests. So they have to keep upping the level of pesticides that are put on these fields. Um, and an example, I was listening to a podcast the other day, a rancher down in Texas was talking about the fact that, I wanna say it was a year and a half ago, an outbreak of armyworms happened. And he said 300, so he's a regenerative rancher, which I'll get a, into that in a minute. But 360 degrees around his ranch, they hit. And literally like farmers would go to bed, wake up, 80 acres was gone. That's how fast they work. And he said, nothing touched their ranch and they don't spray anything. It's because it was a complete ecosystem, animals involved in the ecosystem, the whole system is working right. Um, so the next thing is tilling. That's another big thing. So on the regenerative side, we've got no till, you've got all kinds of things happening here, a lot of life, there's no bare dirt. On this side, we're tilling. So this is the conventional system. So. It, again, in a conventional system, you actually have to till because they're going to deal with weeds, they're going to deal with pests, they're going to deal with just stuff that they want to just clear the slate and start again. Um, and you're killing soil life. You're killing bugs, you're killing microbes, you're killing everything that's happening below the soil. You're killing any rodents or little beneficial um, animals that are in there as well. They're all going. We're losing topsoil at a rate of four tons to 10 tons per acre per year. And along with that goes chemicals and fertilizers polluting our waterways. Um, and a good example of that is the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Has anybody heard of that? Yeah, so it's last I checked, I think it's the size of Rhode Island or Connecticut or something. So it's, it's literally from all of the stuff running off the farms down the Mississippi and it's creating an area where nothing can live. There's no oxygen in the water and it's full of everything from the farms. And our topsoil is going with it, which is super important. So. I love this quote. 
because um, it really encapsulates where we're at. We stand in most places on earth only six inches from desolation, for that is the thickness of the topsoil upon which the entire life of the planet depends. <clears throat> so there's another way, and it's soil first. We start at the core of like, what do we make healthy first in order to have all these other impacts? So soil health. And for example, if you were looking at like your house plants and they're not thriving, wouldn't soil be one of the things you'd be checking? Maybe the soil's depleted, maybe it needs to be repotted, maybe it's been in that same soil for four years, there's no nutrients left in it because there's nothing cycling. So soil is definitely something to look at. So how do we rebuild the soil? Regenerative agriculture. This is the coolest thing. All right, so it describes farming and grazing practices that, among other benefits, reverse climate change by rebuilding soil organic matter and restoring degraded soil biodiversity, resulting in both carbon drawdown and improving the water cycle. This also is really important. Specifically, it is a holistic land management practice that leverages the power of photosynthesis in plants to close the carbon cycle, build soil health, crop resilience, and nutrient density. So regenerative agriculture focuses on building soil organic matter and topsoil. So what's really cool about this is in the past, we've learned that to build topsoil, it would take hundreds of thousands of years because it's such a slow process. But with the system of regenerative agriculture, it can do it at a rate of 0.5 to 1% annually. That might not sound like a lot, but it's huge. So studies suggest that just a 0.4% increase of soil organic matter on our world's croplands would completely negate all of our current CO2 emissions. So when you think about that math, not every farm has to go this way for this to start happening. It can be a ripple effect that happens very quickly because of how fast we can build that soil organic matter. So why is this important? So soil health is central to everything. And some of the big ones on here, um, pest and disease resistance and yield, like that automatically happens just by being in this whole ecosystem. On the farm health side, you've got climate resilience, soil organic matter. Um, we have soil carbon sequestration, water quality and retention, increased biodiversity. Um, and up here, flavor, aroma, it's clean. They don't need to spray pesticides. So it is completely toxin free. It's beyond organic. Um, and nutrition, that's something we'll get to here in a minute. So, um, and oh, and by the way, biodiversity, our whole issue with bee colony collapse disorder, this brings back our pollinators. They actually have somewhere to be and something to do because there's actually a biodiversity of life happening in, in these kinds of systems. So the soil can save us, but we have to save it first. The carbon cycle, I love this graphic. This is from Joyce Farms, they're based out of North Carolina. Um, this just kind of shows it all in a really small scale. So we've got animals, we have the soil, and we have plants. So plants automatically have this amazing ability to bring carbon out of the air. That's what they do. They pull it in, they put it down into the ground. So um, then it's going through to our microbes and how that operates with the roots of plants and trees. They have a really cool symbiotic relationship. So you have microbes, they're pulling nitrogen from the air, they convert it to nutrients that the plant can actually use. And then from the plant, they have something called a liquid carbon pathway. So as they're pulling the carbon from the air, they actually drip uh, sugars to the, um, to the microbes called root exudates and it feeds the microbes. So they have this whole little system going on down there. Then you add in strategically grazed livestock, where they trample and naturally fertilize the land, producing more carbon and life in the soil. And, and the thing with grazers, they have like an automatically amazing symbiotic relationship with grasses because just the tugging that they do with their tongues and the way that it breaks at the, the grasses, it stimulates growth of the plant. Um, and the way they trample, it's just kind of a gentle, you know, breaking of the soil crust and they're actually trampling the stuff back in and they're fertilizing it as they go. Super cool. This has been here all along. We just, <laughs> just, just, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's right here. It's right here. Um, okay. So, and, and one thing I want to point out too is, is soil in the ground is helpful. I mean, this is what helps us actually have healthy food and actually have healthy soil life. Too much carbon in the air, not so great, obviously, with where we're at. So I want to show um, just a little quick video. Let's see if this works. Oh, I can look here. All right, so this is, um, has anybody heard of the Savory Institute? Okay, so <clears throat> you will start hearing about them. They're based in Boulder. They've got hubs all over the world. One of their big ones is in South Africa. Um, and it's based on the work of Alan Savory. And he basically, he's in his 80s now, this is him. 
Um, and he's he figured out this whole aspect of like, how do we do this on a smaller scale in a holistic management practice uh, way for farmers? So this is the land to market program that they are getting ready to launch. And I'm gonna pop the lights here real quick. Cool stuff. That's very mm -hmm. cool. Really <laughs> cool. Yeah. So obviously, generative agriculture, really cool. And Savory Institute is right here, but they're launching this whole program. So the EOV seal means um, ecological outcome verified. So it's actually from soil testing that they can tell that these practices are being done as opposed to a checklist that can be loopholed. We'll talk about that a little bit. So um, there are many great regenerative ag practices. Um, one of the most exciting ones to me is the one involving animals because it just happens so quickly. Um, so that's, that's the one I wanna focus on. So we learned from history. So why, why would we be thinking about how we can treat the land involving animals? This is how it became so fertile here. The Great Plains were extremely fertile when settlers first got here because the you know, other grazers and the bison were moving in huge herds. And there's a couple of different pieces of that. 
not only are they going to keep moving because they're not going to eat what they just fertilized, um, so they're going to keep moving, but they also, there is the whole predator-prey relationship, which doesn't really exist because of our current population now. So, um, so they all moved in pretty tight herds, and that did some amazing things to the land and created this insane fertility. So, um, and, and the other thing too is ruminants co-evolved with plants. So that's why they have this amazing symbiotic relationship where they're getting what they need because this is how they eat. And then the land is getting what it needs from the ruminants. Um, so all grazing animals. So how are we mimicking? So we're mimicking the roaming bison. So an interesting thing here is this open untended access. If you just put like even one cow on a thousand acres for an unlimited amount of time, they're gonna like pick and choose what grasses they want, the tastiest ones, the most nutritious they know. And so you're not really getting the regenerative aspect you need. And they're, they, they don't, like in an, um, a whole field, like a whole pasture, a huge acreage, they don't have the fear of a predator stalking them. So they're gonna spread out, they're gonna do their thing. So how do we mimic what the bison and other grazers did back in the day? So we do adaptive multi-paddock grazing. So what's really cool is there's electric fencing that ranchers are using to move um, cattle into new uh, areas. So these areas get to rest. It could be a couple of months before they come back to it. And everything just grows like crazy because it just got fertilized. It just got um, sparked to have new growth. And the cattle move on to a whole new, um, really nutritious salad bar. And so we've got this whole thing happening and they can do this on all of this acreage and just continue moving them. And the animals are being cared for, they're getting the kind of food that they need and the soil is actually getting regenerated. So it's also known as managed intensive rotational grazing and holistic plant grazing. So when we're looking at regenerative versus um, degenerative, so the importance to me of moving away from industrial food and going to local, so with industrial food, like I mentioned earlier, we've never been at this point in history. We've never been so disconnected from our food um, and we've never been so chronically ill. And it only really began about 50 to 70 years ago. We turned wartime chemicals into peacetime food production. Um, and it was to produce abundant and cheap food as much as we possibly could. And it worked in that sense for a while. Um, also, there were government subsidy programs. Uh, one of the big ones involved in this was from the early 70s, uh, Earl Butts, he was the Secretary of um, Agriculture, US Secretary of Agriculture, and two of his um, kind of famous quotes were plant fence row to fence row and get big or get out. So it was pushing farmers and ranchers to go this direction, to go this direction. Plant as much as you can, doesn't matter, just produce, produce, produce. So it was done to have um, abundant cheap food, not quality and not health. So when we aren't connected to our food, we have no idea where it's coming from. We have no idea what's in it. And the other side of that is companies aren't connected to us either. They don't know who they're selling their food to. So you have um, companies that are selling to faceless, nameless, entire blobs of population. There's no connection there. That's new as well. And people in the supply chain don't even know where the food's coming from. I can guarantee if you ask at almost any restaurant, unless they're sourcing from local farmers and ranchers, they have no clue. So the server's not gonna know. They might go up the chain, talk to the chef, the manager. They're not gonna know. They're gonna probably say Cisco. I've actually gotten that answer. Um, and then even if you call Cisco, do they know? No, because it's coming from thousands of farms all over the States and internationally as well. So no one knows, it's just this whole mess. So obviously things are toxic because we're spraying with pesticides. And if you really want to put it into perspective, I always think, you know, if I walked into a grocery store and somebody's just spraying down, like hosing down the produce with pesticides, not only would you not buy it because you're seeing it happen, but you would get out of there because you don't want to breathe it. So somebody's in a hazmat suit doing this. You're not going to breathe that in, but we're so disconnected from where it's happening. We don't think about it. So we see this beautiful produce that has no blemishes and it's all shiny and it's this whole issue, right? So we buy it, we don't think about it. Same with meat coming from CAFOs. We don't see what's happening and we buy it because it's in the case and that's what we see. So it's nutritionless and it's tasteless. I was talking to a farmer a couple of weeks ago and once he started farming more regeneratively, he was looking at um, the, the difference in tomatoes. He said, I thought I hated tomatoes my whole life and I tried one of my tomatoes, I started growing this way and I freaked out because it actually tasted good. We, and it's been so long we've been in this mm -hmm. too that people don't even realize that our food doesn't taste good anymore. So, oh, I was listening to a podcast. I listen to lots of podcasts. 
uh, there was an oranges example that one of the regenerative ag guys was talking about. He said, in this day and age, you would have to eat eight oranges to get the same amount of nutrition as you did from one orange, our grandparents' generation, so like 70 years ago. That blew my mind. Yeah, um, scary. Yeah. <laughs> scary and times. Well, and unfortunately, and this one is one of the harder ones, organic doesn't solve the problem. Mm -hmm. It's better than conventional because you're not eating as many pesticides. However, most of our um, organic is being produced industrially and so you've got you're still going to have issues with pesticides and or with uh, pests so they're still having to figure out how to deal with that so there's still like allowed things that they can spray on those crops um, but it is better than conventional however is the soil healthy you yep. because it's still being produced industrially and as a monocrop so i was eating an apple the other night and i was like oh this sucks like it's less toxic but I'm eating this whole apple and it's not even doing for me what I really want it to be doing as far as nutrition. So I remember a while back when I learned that there was a lack of nutrients in food, I didn't really know what that meant. I didn't know anything could be done about it. I was like depletion of soil. Okay, I guess that's where we're at. Um, and it, it was just kind of a depressing thing that I just kind of pushed off to the side like all of us do. Um, now I do want to say small organic farms are doing a lot of regener regenerative practices because there are there's like a whole list of them. They don't have to just involve animals. Um, there's things like cover crops, which are in between cash crops, where it's keeping roots in the soil. It's still um, bringing that carbon down. It's still building soil organic matter. Also, it's um, a cover for the soil, so it's actually creating an armor over the soil, protecting it, keeping it cool. Um, there's also lack of tilling, you know, all these different things can be done and a lot of small organic farms do do that. Um, so we move on to um, local regenerative food. So truly knowing our source, our farmers and ranchers being connected to our food and to each other again. It's beyond organic, it's not toxic, it's full of nutrition because the soil is healthy. It helps heal the microbiome. So our whole all of our chronic disease stuff starts to disappear because when people start to eat this way, it actually rebuilds the gut microbiome. Um, and it improves your immunity too. It's like you actually, just like plants, you know, when they actually are getting what they need from the soil and they actually have their own immune system, same thing for us when we're eating that kind of food. We're also eating seasonally and regionally. It's healthier. This is how we evolved. It's more profitable for the farmer and rancher too. Thank goodness, because otherwise it'd be a problem. Uh, so health benefits of regenerative meat. So a lot of people think meat is bad, right? From these other systems, yeah. But in 100% grass-fed or regenerative systems, it's actually reducing inflammation. It's um, fighting cancer and heart disease, richer in flavor, no hormones and antibiotics, benefiting the earth. It's more nutrient dense and there's no grains and GMOs involved in this form of agriculture. Um, and one thing I wanna say, as far as the vegan movement that's happening, um, if that's a personal choice, I totally get that. But if it's for reasons of animal welfare, if it's thinking you're going to get cancer, if it's concern over climate change, you can eat 100% grass fed, regeneratively produced meat again, um, coming from these systems. So regenerative ag cannot be loophole. That's what I love. It's like all these other systems, you can loophole them because they're like a list of criteria. You send in your paperwork. It's like check, 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 done. Nobody's actually checking these industrial organic farms. Um, but in a regenerative system, they're testing the soil. So year after year, they're seeing soil improvement, which proves the practices are happening. So yay, it can't be loopholed. Um, so how do we get involved, right? That's what we all want to know. So this is an acronym that I came up with, regenerative, ethical, and local. Is it real? Because there's a lot of stuff, right? There's a lot of different certifications. There's a lot of different terminology, and it's, it's very confusing. And so I thought, well, what are some of the main things for consumers to look at? Is it regenerative? We're going to start seeing a lot more regenerative ag stuff out there, like with the land and market program. Is it ethical? Fortunately, ethical kind of get wraps up in the wrapped up in the regenerative piece. You've got animal welfare. You've got workers being treated fairly. Kind of the whole ecosystem is positive. Mm -hmm. And is it local? The local food system piece is super important as well. Um, oh, and one thing I want to say about the local part. So we're losing our rural economies. I mean, we already have lost many of them. So many small towns have boarded up because they don't have these farming systems anymore because they've gone to these industrial, big conglomerate corporations. So when you're eating local, not only are you reinvigorating like your local economy, but you're actually having that connection with those farmers and ranchers. So you're bringing back the face-to-face -face interaction. <clears throat> so where do we find this food? I do have a handout that's not here <laughs> because <laughs> this talk took me a little bit of time. But if you want, uh, put your email over there and I will send it to you. 
Um, so Tri Green Rising is building a database um, where our goal in the future is an app so that uh, wherever you are, like it'll show your little blue dot wherever you are on the map and it'll show you these different farms and ranches, restaurants that source this way. Um, so currently we're building the database out um, examples in this area because we're building uh, Boulder and Denver first will be like Macaulay Family Farm up in Boulder. There's Olin Farms in Longmont. There's Black Cat Farm in Boulder. There's uh, Corner Post Meats down in Colorado Springs. A lot of them have CSA programs. A lot of them you'll find at the farmer's markets. Some of them are even seeing their products in stores. I saw Macaulay's, um, they have a Pika Floor uh, hot sauce in Natural Grocer and in Whole Foods. Um, and, and a lot of them are starting to do delivery programs as well. And that's kind of where we're headed with this stuff. The more people ask for this, the more we're going to have those local, local food systems pop up of like local deliveries and uh, the local CSAs where you can actually get more involved with this. Eventually, hopefully it will be going to stores as well, just so it's easier. Um, Savory Institute website, that's a good place to look. They're launching the land to market EOV seal. Um, and then <laughs> this is another fun little slide. Uh oh. Oh, there we go. Okay. Oh, you can't see the words because that thing's in. All right. The worms and their underground friends are ready to do the work. And we have a lot of work to do, too. So, there, we have a huge mindset shift that we have to go through, which takes time. But we can start paying attention. We can learn more. We can start asking the questions. Um, we can start spending our money differently. We can start supporting these local regenerative producers. And eventually, we're, we're going to get there. So where do we want to be spending our time and money? Because we've got two different ways that that can happen. We can either be buying uh, local food and spending time um, preparing it, or we can spend our time being sick and paying for medications. So it's like the money and time thing. Um, there's an inverse relationship too. Quality of food goes up, chronic illness goes down, medications start to drop off, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so, Love this quote. Humankind has not woven the web of life. We are but one thread within it. Whatever we do to, our, to the web, we do to ourselves. All things are bound together. All things connect. So you thought you were going to get out of here with just some information, right? But no, no, we're calling for a revolution. Nice. <laughs> a well, consumer revolution. Woo! Yes. Let's start somewhere. <laughs> right? Woo! So this is a revolution that's focused on love, hope, health, community, and regenerative practices in our communities and in our the way we treat our land. Um, it's grassroots. So those of us on the planet right now, we have a front row seat for where we're at. And we are the ones that have to make this decision. Um, also, it's empowering. Thank goodness we don't have to wait for policy things to change, for government to, to do something, because we've been waiting for a long time. This is something we can do, and it will trickle up the chain. So we've got um, our collective awareness and collective demand creating a positive effect through our food systems, our health, our communities, our economies, eventually up to government and even companies, because companies are starting to pay attention. So everything follows from it. We've got local regenerative food systems. We'll start um, cutting down on our waste issues, um, local regenerative products and services, local composting programs, regenerative community gardens, and um, connection again in our communities, truly healthy food programs at schools and, and anchor institutions as well, like hospitals. Um, big companies and government policy will follow as well, but we have to create the demand. We're the ones who have to start this. So the more that we ask for it, the more we're going to see this. Um, all right. So I have one other little video, a one minute video. Great. Oops. The middle-income farmers have disappeared from this country because we basically have drove them out with the get bigger, get out mantra. The cheap food policy has basically taken all the nutrition out of our food. You know, we've got a lot of calories on the market, but it's not doing our health any good. And the health-conscious consumer sees that very clearly.
So again, that was Savory Institute. All right, so there's a lot of different things that we can focus on as far as having a more regenerative mindset in our lives, but given the insane impact of our food choices, that to me is the first place to start. So as to not get too overwhelmed, focus on food sourcing. Um, our mission for Try Green Rising, we create awareness, provide solutions, and build community around the mission of saving our planet, ourselves, and our future. <laughs> So our focus within that is to connect human health, so the microbiome, <laughs> to um, the soil health, the microbiome of the planet. And to me, that really creates a good connection for people to start understanding why this is so important, not just personally and for our, our individual health, for our families, for our communities, but the global aspect too of what this can do because it can actually reverse climate change. That's what's so amazing about it. <clears throat> so currently you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook. You can also go on our website and enter your email. Um, very soon, we're going to be launching educational videos and your interviews with farmers, ranchers, nutritionists, personal trainers, functional medicine doctors. By the way, functional medicine doctors focus on the microbiome. Totally different kind of medicine. Um, and uh, and it's, it's basically the regenerative agriculture of the body. It's really cool. Uh, database that we're working on. The goal is an app. We'll have farms, ranches, restaurants, and on up the chain. Uh, we're launching a Patreon page, so if you want to support us financially, we have that coming up soon. Larger social media presence and more talks. If you know of any groups that need to hear this message, book me. <laughs> so, um, join the tribe, become the revolution. That's really what we're calling for because it's a community effort, it's a global effort, and it's something we can actually do. It's awesome. Thank Woo! you so much. <laughs> Way to go, man. And what questions do we have? I know that was a lot of info. That was. Have any that questions? was good. Really good. Yay. Um, <laughs> really important. Yeah. I, I don't think that there's, I mean, it needs to be heard by everyone because it really does affect your baseline health. Oh, and yeah. They don't realize that, you know, all this chronic pain, this joint pain, this True. inflammation in True. our body, our own microbiome is disrupted from yeah. the lack of microbiome we're getting from our surrounding areas and then we're killing it on yep. top of it yeah so it's yep. never being refurbished yeah. uh completely so yeah um but sourcing is absolutely huge. essential it's huge. it's huge yeah we're treating our bodies the way we're treating our agriculture right now it's yeah. surgeries and tilling pills and pesticides it's like ding like what is happening right now we have no immune system neither do the plants and everything is crashing all systems are on alert you know uh, one thing i forgot to mention too with the microbiome an example of something like in terms of mental health 90 percent of our serotonin is created in, mm -hmm. by the bacteria in your microbiome so we've got mental health issues out the wazoo in our country as well it's like all of these things are so connected to our nutrition so it's like same as looking at, at the soil and the soil health and it's like how do we fix the core thing that's happening? Same with people. It's like focus on soil, that goes to the gut, that goes to everything, you know? So yeah, awesome point.